Hello, everyone. My name is Andrew. I am also one of the organizers for Papers We Love, but I will be doing the first talk tonight. Um, so the name of this paper, Flipping Bits in Memory Without Accessing Them, um, it kind of is a little bit understated as to what's going on. Um, I think most people here have probably heard about Rowhammer or at least heard something about it. This is the paper that was written that Google wrote their blog post based off of. Um, so first of all, nice beautiful introduction. Looks like pretty much any other paper. Uh, part of the work was done at Carnegie Mellon. Part of it was done with Intel Labs. Um, as you'll see for obvious reasons, working with a company that works in semiconductors is helpful. Um, okay, so to kick it off first, what do we mean by memory from the paper title? This is not memory in terms of like a theoretical architecture. This is the stuff you would go to Best Buy and buy. This is the physical chips. This is uh, volatile memory. It needs power. You buy it on a stick. It's DRAM. It's not SRAM, which is memory, but elsewhere in your computer. Um, so yeah, probably what you think of first when you think of memory, but just to make sure everyone is clear when we're looking at this. Okay, so we're going to dive a little bit into how memory is kind of set up in your computer before we start messing with it, just so everyone's on the same page. Uh, DRAM with this beautiful diagram you can see from the paper, um, is basically there's a processor, there's some sort of bus between it, and then you have your memory. It is a bank which has multiple rows of data that is some width wide. You put multiple banks together into a rank. This is actually has several chips underlying it. Um, for the most part, it's not super important how the whole chip is put together because all the experiments are really actually done on an individual chip which is just a much smaller subset of memory. So instead of being multiple gigabytes of memory we're looking at, we're usually looking at the case of like uh, 64,000 cells by maybe like uh, 8 or uh, 16K uh, columns. So we have several operations that you can do in DRAM. Um, here's another handy diagram. Uh, pay attention to the part on the left where we have both the rows and the cells. Um, although this is organized as a grid, um, since it is actually an electrical circuit, the way you access data is a little bit uh, weird. You still give it a row and a column that you want to pick, but when you need to read data, you're going to take an entire row, raise the voltage on it. It's called the word line. So you raise that to a high voltage. This is going to take all the values there and stick them into the bottom in the row buffer. This is actually where it can read data and pass it to the rest of the computer. Um, this operation which is not super intuitive, is actually destructive. So as soon as you read this data, all the data that was in the memory is gone and it only exists in the row buffer. Um, not super strange because obviously you can just write it back after you're done. But this becomes very important later on when we start examining how you start flipping bits. So to read data, you take an entire row, you raise the voltage on it, you move it into the row buffer, you pull out whatever bits you want based on um, the rest of your address, um, each individual column is called a cell. Uh, they'll use these interchangeably with cells and columns, rows and word lines. Um, and then you, you know, either write your data back or if you're, um, sorry, if you are done reading, you write your data back and you clear the row buffer. Re uh, writes are very similar. You start off with raising the voltage on a row. You take whatever values are there. You don't particularly care. Um, you overwrite the data in the row buffer, which you got from the processor or wherever else it's doing stuff. Then you write the values back to the row and you lower the voltage. So pretty straightforward operation, nothing too crazy. Um, the second diagram is not super important. It's just showing how a word line is arranged with a bit line or a cell. Um, so you can basically raise and lower voltage uh, to get certain op uh, values to be able to be mobile. Um, what is important in that diagram is that it's using a capacitor. If you've ever spent time with uh, electronics, you know that capacitors are great, except they can be a little bit fuzzy as to the rate at which they discharge, um, how you get them to charge, how long it takes them to charge. For the most part in modern electronic circuits, we've gotten good enough that you can just kind of ignore this. You can say something is zero or one without thinking about how long it takes to get to be zero or one, or where exactly we have the threshold for this is zero and this is one. In this case, it's actually very important. Knowing how these things actually behave underneath the covers is very useful for trying to understand why you can see differences when you're trying to like raise and lower things and getting anomalous results. Um, so we have read and write. We also have refresh. So basically, we know we have capacitors. We know capacitors lose charge over time. These are electronic circuits. You need your memory to always have power, otherwise everything goes away. The refresh operation basically goes through, reads every row, 
and writes it back to itself. So say over time you know that you're going to start losing some charge. If you go back, you read the value and you write it back, you go back to like kind of your original good values that haven't really decayed too much in your capacitor. Um, so every, according to the DRAM spec, every 64 milliseconds, you need to have refreshed every single row. So they have a special command to do this. The memory controller is in charge of making sure that every row gets refreshed. But it's a little bit up to the memory controller as to how that happens. It could just go one by one, pause all read and write operations and refresh everything, which is not a very helpful operation. They are usually a bit more sophisticated. They spend a little bit of time like knowing, keeping track of which ones they've refreshed in the past 64 milliseconds and then planning when they need to refresh the other ones to make sure they get refreshed. Um, operationally, it's the same thing. It just does a read operation and then writes the data back. Um, nothing particularly strange there, uh, but it's good to know that the, kind of your maximum time window is 64 uh, milliseconds before it's going to like basically erase any progress you've had towards potentially flipping bits. All right, so now we're going to get a little bit into the methodology of the paper. It's not super complicated. Um, this is the code they use. There's two examples here. The one on the left is the one that works. The one on the right is the one that doesn't work. Um, basically, all the stuff that's actually doing anything is the, the move cop, uh, excuse me, the move commands. They're, you take some value, you move it to some register in your CPU. You're basically just reading data out of memory. Um, the CL flush, the M fence, those are just basically making sure that nothing gets stuck in a processor cache or a read cache somewhere else. Um, they're not super important to the operation here, um, besides making sure you're actually doing what you think you're doing. When they set up their system, they built a custom FPGA, so they're not actually running through a whole modern computer. They just built a small system that they could uh, plug the RAM chips into to monitor stuff very easily. Um, the memory is not always initialized to zero or one. They tried a whole bunch of different things. They know it might be zeros, ones. They did checkerboard patterns, striping, uh, random. To be honest, there weren't too many unique results aside from a few of the striping uh, operations, but it was you know, more for completeness. Um, for X and Y in the first example, they are very carefully chosen. They are chosen so that they are um, in the same bank, but in different rows. So in our previous diagram, we had multiple rows uh, that kind of built up banks and ranks and stuff like that. So basically, you want to be on the same section of memory, but using different rows. Um, for AMD chips that they were testing, they were able to figure out, um, like AMD kind of publishes a spec. Intel, they had to reverse engineer stuff, and it's kind of funny because the guy was working at Intel or with Intel, but still had to do this. It might have been after he had started. Um, and just to get a little bit into what is going on here, um, we think that, well, not we think, the paper states that reading is the operation that can cause your data to basically start flipping bits. However, if you read the same value multiple times, it's already in that row buffer, so it's never gonna leave that row buffer. It's just gonna keep sitting there, giving you kind of basically it's like pseudo cached value before actually writing it back and setting the values. So that's why you need to have two operations. So you're basically moving between two different points in memory, forcing it to finish writing back that row buffer and potentially flipping bits each time. All right, um, a couple more quick comments on the methodology. They tested a ton of different chips from different manufacturers. Um, they named them A, B, and C. They didn't actually name which ones were which, though they supposedly reached out to all the vendors. They tested chips over, I think, the past six or seven years. And they even tested, they tried to figure out like which runs of chips and uh, potentially architecture changes in the chips over time. They mostly did this by looking at uh, like IDs on the boxes that you might buy and stuff like that to try and figure out exactly where uh, these things are coming from. So the results. You get this beautiful chart and my beautiful annotations on it. Um, this is basically showing on the bottom is the date. On the left side is the number of errors per, I think, 100,000 cells or million cells. I'm not, I can't remember how to do that math in my head right now. 100 million cells? Yeah. Um, you see some pretty strong correlations, and they have some theories on this. Mostly it's, one, as time goes on, you get more errors because you're getting more dense, and we know that the problems are due to voltage leak leakage so that you can, like, the more closer things are, the more stuff is going to leak between them. That's pretty intuitive, and we had known of that before. Um, however, you can also see some pretty clear things where they started a new chip, saw a lot of issues, and then over time, they perhaps got better at making the chip, which is why you see the errors go down by several orders of magnitude over time. And then they kick back up. Um, so they have three different, th three different vendors here, A, B, and C. Um, 
in general, after they did these kind of first set of tests and observed these errors um, by you know, running these tests and then reading the values back, seeing how many errors there were, they didn't want to keep doing it over hundreds of memory chips because it's just too many. So they picked the most vulnerable chip from A, the most vulnerable chip from B, and the second most vulnerable chip from C. So trying to get kind of some really good test candidates and also one that's just a little bit more realistic as to what you might expect to see on a random machine. All right, so activations, this is basically how many times do we actually go and read those two rows? You get this beautiful, exactly as you'd expect, like you're, you should never see values like this. This is such a beautiful fit on this line. Um, it's very terrifying. Um, so you can see that A is the worst because it has the most errors. Um, the activation interval along the bottom is basically how frequently are you activating this. The more you go to the left, the faster you're doing it, which is why you see the most errors. There's a little bit of weirdness on the left where it doesn't quite fit this curve. Um, that's because there's a minimum amount of time for those capacitors to recharge. And as you get kind of to the minimum activation interval of I think 55 or 50 nanoseconds, you kind of are hitting that refresh interval and it will never actually uh, like finish fully charging. So you're not quite able to produce the same results that you thought to before. Um, you see it pop back up because when you hit the actual minimum, that's uh, syncing up with how many actual commands you can put in there before the refresh comes through. And the memory controllers have a little bit of code that if you have commands backed up, they don't refresh exactly in 64 milliseconds. So you see them actually get a little bit of extra time, which is why the errors go back up. Same thing, they charted how often if they refresh. In the middle of the line is the default, 64 milliseconds. If they refresh way more often than that, every 16 milliseconds, the number of errors goes down kind of as we expect, and these, the opposite is true. The longer you take between refreshes, the less time, or the more errors you get because you're basically more vulnerable, you have more time to exploit the system. Nothing super exciting um, beyond the initial result here because you kind of expect all these things to hold true. All right, uh, location. This is a little bit weird. This first one is victim rows per aggressor row. So basically they count an aggressor, aggressor row is where they're setting or reading the values from, and victim rows are where they've managed to flip a bit or a cell somewhere. Um, you would expect it to be one or two, like the rows neighboring where you're actually reading from, but weirdly and kind of spookily, you can, you know, some of them hit up to three, and A, which is particularly bad in this case, hit up to like nine uh, rows away, which is a pretty surprising result for how much you'd expect voltage to be leaking and how quickly it should be dropping off. Second, we have basically which rows um, see the differences. The values all the way on the extreme sides are everything like more or less than eight offset away. Um, they had one showing up at like 2,000 offset away, but their theory is that this is memory that had basically had a bad cell in that row and had been relocated, so they weren't really able to identify the physical layout properly, and it was actually in some other chip or something like that. Um, This is, uh, this is a little bit of the scary part. So when this first came out, people said, oh, you would just use ECC. How bad could it be? Um, the answer is pretty bad. Uh, so ECC, uh, single error correction, double error identification, uh, SecDEC is uh, usually the standard. So if you have one bit that gets flipped, you can correct that. If there's two, you know that there's an error, but you can't correct it. Um, and people thought, okay, great, we'll just, we'll just correct these errors. How bad? What's the problem? Uh, everything in bold, is something that can't be corrected by ECC. Uh, everything at X equals three or four is stuff that ECC will say is fine and is actually broken. Um, so ECC will prevent the vast majority of simple errors, but does not eliminate these entirely. The paper had uh, some other interesting conclusions. Um, besides the, sorry. This was the, uh, the striping. This is the different patterns. Um, the first thing they came across was that weak cells, cells that if they just kind of let the system run for a while and let them discharge over time without ever refreshing, are not the same as victim cells. So it's not necessarily a weakness in the underlying individual cells in an electronic circuit. There are multiple things going on here. Um, errors are repeatable. Um, they can test the same chip multiple times and actually identify which cells are the most likely to be flipped. Uh, it's mostly temperature independent. They did a range of tests at hot and cold temperatures, which often can affect electronics. Didn't really seem to affect this. Um, errors are not related to, isolated to neighbors, but those are the most common ones. This is pretty much what you'd expect, to be honest. Um, errors in cells that have gone are cha uh, from changed, uh, sorry, charged to uncharged. 
So for RAM, normally you'd expect one is high, zero is low. It's actually not the case uh, for all RAM chips. It's up to the manufacturer whether they want to decide if uh, a low charge is a zero or a one. However, when they dug into the chips they're investigating and kind of got the specs for them, they are able to identify that it always, almost always, like 98% of the time, is a cell that was charged going to discharge as opposed to the other way around, um, which is kind of surprising. You would have expected it to either be 50-50 or 100% and 0%, but there seems to be a lot more going on underneath the, uh, underneath the covers. So some solutions. The first one is pretty straightforward. You just make better chips. Um, it's tough. There's a lot of physics, a lot of uh, underlying electronics to deal with. It's not super easy to just make better chips cost effectively and still keep all of your performance. Um, you can correct errors. Again, not great as we saw, it won't get all the errors. And it's about a 12.5% capacity cost just for basic ECC. And that goes up the more bits you try and correct. So it's very, you know, losing 12.5% of your RAM capacity is not particularly an easy sell to people. We all know that, or sorry, not we all, but the paper states that uh, the more often you refresh, the fewer errors you get. So why don't we just refresh more often? It takes about 10 to 30% more energy um, if you move the refresh rates down to a point where you're not going to be seeing errors uh, very often, um, which is not really a great way to, again, sell this to people. Um, refresh bad cells. Uh, the manufacturer can do this. However, it takes days, potentially, to, for each RAM chip to identify which cells are bad. So it's not really a great way to make sure you have enough RAM available to the public. Um, you can retire bad cells as a user. Uh, there's a bunch of research they linked. There were no great solutions. Nothing seemed to be perfect. And there's definitely an overhead. And you needed to know about the layout of your chips, things like that. Um, and you can refresh neighbors of hot rows, rows that have been read a lot. There was a lot of research into this as well. And they could not find a, an easy win. You, they tried a lot of things like bloom filters and to you know, track on the cell which ones are being accessed to be able to know which ones to refresh. And it, there were no great solutions here. Um, they came up with something called probabilistic adjacent row activation, which is anytime a row is accessed, have a very small chance of refreshing neighborhood, neighbors. So this is just a static probability um, because they know that you know, it might take hundreds of thousands or millions of accesses to flip something. So what we should just do is they set it to uh, 0 0.001. And what they'll do is just 0, 0, 0.001, we'll refresh it, and otherwise we'll leave it alone. So, and we'll probably trigger this before needing uh, any bits actually get flipped. This is a table basically talking about um, if we don't refresh our system for, in one case, 64 milliseconds, which is the re normal refresh rate, or if we don't ref refresh it for one year, what is the chance we're going to get uh, bit flips based on however, like, the three columns are just the number of activations they do. They basically show it's a very small chance once you have para activated to do this. To my knowledge, no one has actually implemented this, um, but I'm not sure uh, if that's actually what's going on. And to do this, you do need to have the memory controller knowing the layout of the chip, which is not necessarily going to be something that manufacturers want to do or have done in the past. Um, so you definitely need to kind of get both sides working on this problem. And uh, they didn't seem to have a lot of luck with some of the memory manufacturers, getting them to be very helpful. All right. Um, so getting back to the, not the title, but the introduction of this talk, uh, Rowhammer. This was an attack by Google that basically gave, uh, it weaponized this paper. It demonstrated them on various laptops, consumer grade ones. People, like, I think there's probably, they didn't name all of them if I'm, I might be wrong, but I, they, I think they tested Apple laptops, Dell, like pretty much standard consumer ones, things that your developers might be using. Um, gave you some code you can test it for yourself. You can run it locally. There's a Go program that you can download and compile really quickly. Um, there's several offshoot attack variations, uh, RAM bleed, I think, and one or two others. They're all based around the same principle, just doing different things in different ways uh, to get bit flips and a lot of attacks around knowing where in memory you need to be inducing the bit flips, like in the page table or permissions and stuff like that. Someone read SSH keys out with this. It was kind of terrifying. Um, I think my favorite part about Rowhammer and this paper is that, weirdly enough, it actually executes kind of in like human time. So it's not either millions of years or 10 nanoseconds. So like it can take five minutes. So you could like literally see a TV show, like someone starts running a program and like you could actually have like a tense moment where they're waiting for it to complete to get into the system and it would actually be reasonable, which is a nice change of pace. Um, so yeah, that's all I had on Rowhammer, but I am ready to take questions. And what we're gonna do, oh yeah.
we have a mic in the back, and I have this hot mic up here. Uh, and so we will take questions if you raise your hand. We'll do you know, two or three. Over here. So you pointed out that uh, a lot of the solutions don't have, uh, well, there aren't great solutions for solving the uh, just the corruption problem, but are there uh, b any workarounds or solutions to avoiding uh, defending against Rohammer like a attacks that would l lose memory? Um, I haven't dug too much into that. I know that there's a lot of work around being able to refresh cache lines or say like, we know that our memory is this, we're gonna take this large amount of space and try and uh, allocate it continuously so that we can make sure that like we control all the rows in our cell and stuff like that. Um, I'm not really sure of a lot of uh, publicized mitigations, but I really haven't dug into it that much. Over here again. Borrow your hands. Thanks. Um, do you know what made them look into this initially? Like it seems kind of conspicuous that things started happening about three years before they started looking into this. Um, there had been some other research. I don't have it linked here. But I think someone had done some work in 2009 on voltage leakage. Uh, the author of the paper, uh, Kim, had, I think, done a bunch of other work in similar uh, fields before, although I didn't really dig too much into the references. But I know he referenced a bunch of his own papers when setting up the methodology and stuff like that, which means that he's probably been poking around with it for a while. Thanks. So for the voltage leakage, I guess one of the, uh, did they, so one of the things that changed uh, in terms of material was Rojas. To be Rojas compliant, you had to remove lead, which has a greater protection against leakage of voltage mm -hmm. from the chips. So the question is, when they were testing the chips, did they test pre-Rojas chips versus post-Rojas chips? That um, was not mentioned in the paper or the footnotes that I saw. Um, you can see, like, they have a giant chart. Oh, come on, we can go through this. Let's go. Um, you can see that when they're basically their statistics, it shows a big range of stuff that they were actually working through. Almost there. Um, but it's a large range of years. I'm not quite sure when those uh, came into place. Gotcha. Um, so you can see that a lot of the earlier chips just had no errors because maybe the density wasn't high enough. It could be related to that as well. They didn't really speculate on the materials in the chips. This was much more of a, we're going to go out and buy a bunch of chips and see what happens. Um, but yeah, that's, it's an interesting approach. All right. Thank you so much. I'm going to take three minutes here to swap out laptops. So a lot of problems in manufacturing boil down to trying to paint an arbitrary polygon with a brush of some size. Um, lawn mowing is one of these problems. You have a lawn, you need to cut all of the grass, you have a mower of a fixed size, and you want to do it um, with the least amount of walking possible. Milling is another example. Um, it costs time in your manufacturing process to move the drill around. But I particular, I in particular am interested in this problem um, because in the past five years, consumer grade computerized sewing machines have come down in price a whole lot. And this has spurned a lot of interest in making open source um, embroidery digitizers. Um, and embroidery turns out to be one of these um, paintbrush problems. Even though the thread itself is very thin, um, when you have a defined stitch um, from a distance, it looks like a solid band. And so um, regardless of what stitch type you use, you still have to find a path over your entire shape. Now, why this is an active field of research? I mean, if your shape is um, convex, it's extremely easy to find a path. You just start at maybe the northmost point and go left to right down the shape until you reach the bottom. But if your shape is um, concave, you'll run into problems. So imagine you were going to mow this star. Um, when you get to the star's crotch, 
you can either go left or right, but you're going to have to backtrack to get to the path that you didn't go to. So um, if we want to turn this into a computational geography problem, we should first find a set of grid points within the shape, and the grid points should be the size of our lawnmower across, and if we visit every point in the shape, in this grid, we have, by definition, covered the entire shape. Um, in this paper, they just state that you can identify the points within this shape in order n, capital N, plus n log n time. So capital N is the number of points in the shape, and lowercase n is the number of sides on the shape. They don't give a citation for this or an explanation, so my notes are just how. Um, <laughs> But it turns out that this is a well-known result in um, computational geography, geometry rather. So again, if you have a convex polygon, the problem is very easy, it's order n, because like the lawn mowing problem, you just start at the northmost side and go left to right, filling in points. Um, to deal with a concave shape, you have to deal use uh, Chazelle's algorithm to chop up the concave shape into a bunch of convex shapes. And this takes n log n time, where n is the number of sides of the polygon. The way this works is that you express your polygon in a binary search tree, where the sides are ordered by their distance to an arbitrary point. Um, to find all of the edges within that polygon that um, intersect any arbitrary line takes order log n time. So if you do this for all of the edges in the polygon, it will take n log n time, and that allows you to find bisecting lines to turn it into a set of convex shapes. If you search for Chazelle's algorithm in uh, Google, you will find this amazing piece of computer archaeology back from the very early days of Stack Overflow when people weren't really sure what Stack Overflow was used for and they asked very esoteric and lovely questions. Um, and for, this is the number one answer to this question of powerful algorithms that are too complex to al implement. And it is a very beautiful algorithm, but it doesn't really make sense to implement because there's a much easier algorithm which is just um, define a set of grid points um, that covers the boundaries of your shape, and then for each point, just determine whether it's in the shape or not. And that's a lot easier to implement, and computers, it's like, we have the computers to do it. Um, so <laughs> I don't implement Chazelle's algorithm. Um, okay, so we have our grid of points. Um, now we just have to find a Hamiltonian cycle. A Hamiltonian cycle is like traveling salesmen, um, you have a, uh, a graph and you want to visit all of the nodes of the graph in the most efficient path possible. And to find the most efficient path possible takes order of n factorial because you have to check every point and then every connection to that point and so on. And if we ever found an efficient algorithm for this, then um, computer science theory would basically be over because Finding a Hamiltonian cycle is equivalent to uh, a Boolean satisfiability problem, um, which is NP-complete. However, that's where um, the approximation in the approximation algorithm comes in. So um, we can use the fact that a related problem is really simple. So finding an Euler Eulerian tour means you have a graph and you want to find a path that visits every edge at least once, and you can visit the nodes as much as you want. And if you've ever played Dragon Age Inquisition, these are the Astrarium puzzles, and you can tell that this is an easy problem because console gamers can solve it. Oh. <laughs> In, <laughs> I'm sorry if that violates the, um, the, the code of conduct to say that. We'll have a chat afterwards. Um, <laughs> 
in addition, um, you are guaranteed to find a solution if all of the nodes in your graph have an even number of edges. So there's this approximation algorithm for the Hamiltonian cycle called the Christofides algorithm. There's a really lovely Wikipedia page um, that I, all of these graphs are stolen from. Um, and the algorithm is as follows. Number one, find a minimum spanning tree of all of the nodes in your graph. So the minimum number of edges you need to um, get to all of the nodes in the graph. Second, take all of the nodes in this graph of minimum spanning tree that have an odd number of connections and pair them so that you end up with a uh, combined graph that has all even numbers of edges. You find an Euler Eulerian tour and then you just uh, remove the edges where you're visiting the same node twice. And this is an approximation algorithm. It runs in polynomial time and it guarantees that the um, maximum path will be only 50% longer than the optimal path. And so the main result of the paper um, is an approximation algorithm for this lawn mowing problem. So it guarantees that um, the path is at least within six-fifths of the optimal path. So for the rest of this talk, I'm just going to go over that, and then I'll be done if you're really bored by lawn mowing. So the first step is to trace the outside of the shape. Then for um, you go from the top to the bottom, and for two rows, uh, rows where there are, are two rows of empty spaces, you pull in the um, boundary from the left or right. And for rows where there is a single row beneath it of empty spaces, you pull it south. So on the example here, we're pulling left. We pull left again. We're pulling left here. We pull left again here. Here we have to pull right because pulling left would remove these um, boundary points. And then at the bottom, we pull down. And you'll notice that we have two points left over up here and down here. Um, the paper goes over all of the possible permutations of um, points that would be left over by this, um, by this process and gives suggestions for how to um, connect them with minimal backtracking. And finally, the proof of their, um, of, of their approximation is to construct a uh, worst case scenario for um, lawn mowing. Um, and you can see here that we have, you can see that it's six over five because we have in each of these little modules, we have uh, five nodes that are connected by six edges. So. If you go home this summer and uh, your parents give you some extra spending money if you mow their lawn, um, you will now know the optimal algorithm. Thank you. Thank you. Let's do two or three questions again. Oh, we got one back here, it looks like. Or, yes? You mentioned that you use this for like practical purposes because you have a machine that'll do this. What is the, like, how do you actually, like, smooth the edges? Is it just you do a perimeter and the actual, like, shape you want to, like, cut over any rough edges? Or is, like, the resolution fine enough with the number of points you have that doesn't really matter? Yeah, like, typically in embroidery, um, the size of the shape that you're looking at is, um, like, five, to cent five centimeters or so across. And the actual individual stitches are, like, three millimeters. Um, so, yeah, it's pretty fine resolution that from a distance you can't... Um, see any uh, edges like that. So, and also you can, um, you can fudge this a little bit by um, making trapezoids and not just regular, uh, regular graphs. Right up front. Um, I'm wondering if the algorithm can be extended for <clears throat> like a uh, movements which are differently penalized. So like, I don't know if, if turning my lawnmower is particularly expensive or if like running my lawnmower with the blades off is super cheap or, or things like that. Yeah, I mean, that's like 
in the entire point of like genetic, the early problems in genetic programming were to solve things like this. Um, in the geometry stuff, they don't tend to focus on it um, because that's a much harder problem to solve with just graphical methods. Um, but I know that genetic programming, you can like put in those penalties. All right. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. And another two minutes to get the next one set up. So, um, my name is Max Marone. The paper's name is Branch Prediction and the Performance of Interpreters. Just quick show of hands. Um, who's at least heard of Branch Prediction? Okay, many of you. Uh, who's um, who's familiar enough with interpreters to have seen bytecode? Okay, fewer of you. Interesting. Uh, that's okay. This paper deals with the intersection of hardware and software, so it's going to be kind of dense and technical. Uh, but I'll pause a couple of times for questions in the middle. Uh, what we're going to talk about is branch prediction. Then we're going to talk about interpreters. Then, like a good high school English essay, we will synthesize and talk about <laughs> branch prediction and the performance of interpreters. And then, like a great high school English essay, we will overthink the source material and try to draw some overly broad conclusions. Are you ready? Let's go. All right, branch prediction very, very basically. You have some code like this. It's an if statement that depends on the result of some kind of computation. In this case, it's a multiplication, s times c, and a comparison is i less than that. So the CPU does that computation, but for reasons that I won't get into, waiting for that to finish would be too slow. Um, it's about a 20 cycle penalty, and you can do a lot in 20 cycles. So instead, what it does is it makes a guess. Uh, it makes a snap judgment as soon as it sees that there is a branch instruction. And that snap judgment is based on the branch history, a record of what this branch has done in the past, as well as potentially what other, br uh, other branches around it have done in the past. If this guess turns out to be correct, if that snap judgment is correct, then the branch is free. Execution just continues as if nothing happened. If the guess turns out to be incorrect, then we have to go back and incur that uh, expensive overhead. We just eat the 20 cycle penalty. So there's a really fun stack overflow question. Why is processing a sorted array faster than processing an unsorted array? Branch prediction. You're doing something like this. Uh, you're looping through an array and you're doing something dependent on the element's value. So in this case, we're counting the number of elements that are greater than four. If the array is unsorted, if it's shuffled, then the direction that that if statement takes will be effectively random. It'll go false, true, true, false, 50% uh, uh, unpredictably. There's no pattern for the branch predictor to pick up here. Um, so the branch predictor, no matter how uh, sophisticated it is, probably won't be able to do much better than getting it right 50% of the time. So half the time that branch is free, half the time we're eating a 20 cycle penalty. On the other hand, if the array is sorted, then there's going to be a streak of the branch going one way, followed by a streak of the branch going the opposite way. So there's an easy pattern for the branch predictor to pick up here. It can just say that the branch will do the same thing that it did last time. Uh, and it might have some trouble at the changeover points. It might get like the first couple wrong. But basically, that kind of consistent pattern is perfectly predictable and it'll execute very, very quickly. In the case of the Stack Overflow question, it was something like six times faster. So branch prediction, in essence, is all about letting the CPU find and exploit patterns in the way that your program is actually executing at runtime. Now, that was a very basic example. Um, that was just an if statement that could go one way or the other, and the pattern was simple, too. It was just uh, whatever was wherever the branch did last time. Uh, what other patterns the branch predictor is capable of recognizing depends on what kind of branch it is. So what we just looked at was called a direct branch. Uh, basically, it means that there's a binary choice, true or false, taken or not taken. This includes if-else statements. It also includes loops, because a loop is just a go-to hidden behind an if-else statement. 
it's easy to build a predictor for this. And I say easy, I mean, this is the subject of like PhDs and there's literally a journal on branch prediction. So it's not easy, but it's easier. Um, and branch predictors for direct branches like this do astonishingly well, like in the 99.9% .9 success rate range. Most branches like this are highly predictable. Um, and because of this binary choice, we can store that in one bit, which means we can store very long histories, which means that a branch predictor can detect way more complicated patterns than just whatever it did the last time. It can do like alternating true or false or uh, true depending on what the last branch did, which helps with like long if else chains. The other kind of branch is an indirect branch. Uh, unlike direct branches, these can have arbitrarily many targets, which makes them uh, infinitely harder to build a predictor for. So this includes things like uh, executing a function pointer or a lambda expression. Uh, it includes virtual method calls because uh, the um, virtual method is accessed through a, a V table to figure out which method, uh, which you know, concrete method uh, is called dynamically. Uh, it also includes big switch statements. The compiler typically implements them by a table lookup. It's much harder to build a predictor for these. Um, quote from this paper, for a long time, indirect branch targets were just naively predicted. The target of the last occurrence of the branch was predicted. So uh, just the same thing that happened last time again. Okay, uh, someone uh, shout out their favorite interpreted language. Python. Python, you are correct. Your favorite interpreted language is Python. <laughs> so we run a Python function. We, you know, hands it over the interpreter. The first thing that the interpreter does is turn it into bytecode. Bytecode in Python looks like this, for CPython at least. Um, we don't need to know exactly what each of these instructions is doing, but we should know basically how the interpreter is going to execute this. It's gonna start at the top. It'll handle each bytecode instruction on a case-by-case -case basis. So it'll uh, have code for load fast instructions, load constant instructions, and so on. And it's, in a sense, emulating what a CPU does. So how would you write something like that in C? Something like this, you have a while loop with a big switch statement in it and you just handle it case by case. You have a case statement for compare op and so on. Now if you were paying attention a couple slides ago, you might be able to see where this is going. This is a big switch statement. This is one of these things, a big indirect branch, the kind of branch that's harder to build a predictor for. And because we're doing this in a tight loop, our interpreter will encounter that indirect branch unusually frequently. Um, Interpreters perform a large number of indirect branches, up to 13% of all instructions. So 13%, this is already pretty bad. 13% of the instructions you're executing are just deciding what instructions to execute. Um, but it gets worse. Mispredictions on that switch statement are responsible for wasting over half of the actual CPU time, the actual running time spent running the program. Um, this is a quote from one of the papers that this paper cites. Uh, I think it provides context, so I quoted a couple of times. So let's look again at the Python bytecode to see why uh, these branch mispredictions occur so frequently and why they're so expensive. No bytecode instruction here is repeated twice in a row. So the thing, the only thing that a simple indirect target branch predictor can do doesn't happen here. However, if we stare at this for long enough, we might realize that the bytecode does follow certain patterns. For example, the pop jump if false instruction tends to occur after the compare op instruction. So there are patterns to find in here, it's just that the branch predictor is too dumb to see them. So if we could figure out how to work with the branch predictor, we would stand to gain a lot of performance. Fortunately, there is a trick. Uh, this apparently dates in some form to the 1970s. Uh, the history is a little bit foggy for me because I think our authors are referring to it by the wrong name. They're calling it jump threading, so that's the term I'm using here. I think the rest of the literature refers to it as either direct threading or indirect threading. Um, anyway, so the trick is 
as before, as in the big switch statement, we have one case to handle each kind of bytecode instruction. However, instead of one giant monolithic branch uh, wrapping around all these cases, dispatching between them as we had before, in jump threading, each case is followed by its own branch. So after executing a load const instruction, there's a branch where we get the next instruction and that branch can go to any of the other cases depending on what it finds. After a compare op instruction, there is another branch, identical but separate, also dispatching to any of the other cases depending on what the next instruction is, and so on. So the naive implementation is on the left, the jump threading technique is on the right. Uh, function functionally, this does exactly the same thing as what we had before, and it looks a whole lot messier. So why is it better? Well, with the big switch statement, we have one single branch, and that branch follows a complicated pattern that's too hard to predict. On the right, we have many branches, each of which potentially follows a simpler, bat a simpler pattern that can be easier to predict. So for example, uh, we'll go back to the uh, compare op followed by pop jump if false bias. After executing compare op, we go get the next instruction, and it could dispatch to any of the other cases depending on what we find. However, because of the historical patterns of this program, this particular indirect branch will be very strongly biased towards pop jump if false and that branch will be uh, predicted successfully and the program will execute quickly. Um, at this point, you might be wondering what this looks like in code. Well, this can't be implemented in standard C, so sorry. Um, you can kind of see why. There's no nesting. It's all kind of, it's as if there's a bunch of loops that are interleaved with each other. There's no structure to it. Um, you can do it with GCC extensions or with inline assembler. I have slides for it, but um, for time, I think I'm going to skip them. If someone's curious later, uh, bring it up and I'll be happy to go over them. Anyway, the key to success here is that by separating out the branches, we've exposed more surface area to the branch predictor. And this really, really works. Um, in 2001, Ertl and Greg say, threaded code interpreters cause fewer mispredictions and are almost twice as fast. That's not twice as, that's not half the overhead, that's the total time uh, is cut in half. You can double the performance of your interpreter just by rewriting that big main switch statement loop. Uh, they implemented this in the Python interpreter sometime around 2009 maybe. Uh, source comment claims it makes the interpreter 15 to 20 percent faster. And then at long last we reach our paper, the paper I love from 2015. Uh, claiming speed ups of 10.1% down to 2.8%. All right, so what's going on here? In, we started off with it makes the interpreter twice as fast, and now we're down to you get a 2.8% speed up. Well, the hardware got better. The benefits of threaded code decreases with each new generation of microarchitecture. The optimization is obsolete. This is the bulk of the paper. Um, this graph, I think, is presented kind of obnoxiously. It's a little bit confusing. The horizontal axis does not matter. It's just which benchmark is run, so we don't care about that. It's not a time series or anything. Um, the vertical axis is how much the optimization matters, and the color of the bar is the age of the CPU. So by eyeballing it, the black bars, the optimization matters a lot, and that's for uh, Intel and Halem about 2008. Uh, gray is in the middle, 2011, and by 2013, the white bars, it hovers pretty consistently about, around 1.0. The optimization just doesn't do anything at all. You can flip this around. You can look at the uh, misprediction rate instead of the total speed up. MPKI is mispredictions per thousand instructions, so it's the same deal. Uh, higher means the optimization matters more. Um, same thing. Uh, this graph also includes Tage, which is not a real CPU, it's a benchmark branch predictor that they're uh, kind of comparing against, and we'll go over that in a second. So this uh, benchmarking branch predictor that they're using uh, in the paper for illustrative purposes is probably worth a lightning talk on its own, 
but I want to very briefly show how it works just so that uh, branch predictors are demystified a little bit and we get a sense of how far we've come from the basic strategy of just predict the branch to go to the same place it did the last time. Um, it's suspected maybe that some Intel CPUs are actually using this. Obviously, we don't know. There are two inputs to the branch predictor. Number one, which branch it is. So we have a stream of machine code instructions. The branch is executed by its address in memory, the program counter. Input number two is the global branch target history. So every time we take an indirect branch, we record where it goes up to some length. So those are our two inputs. We combine them somehow, hash them together. From that, we get an index of some reasonable length. The index is used to access the prediction table. This contains what we want. It contains the branch prediction target, but it also contains some important bookkeeping stuff, including a tag. So the tag is some other way to identify the combination of the last n targets and which branch we're trying to predict. Um, this is a way to disambiguate between um, hash collisions, basically. Um, this seems obvious, maybe. I mean, in a sense, we're kind of implementing a hash table in hardware. This is not what branch predictors used to do. They, um, they kind of just dealt with hash collisions and tried to separate it out in fuzzier ways by combining a bunch of predictors together. So this is novel. The output of this table, if that tag matches a prediction, otherwise it doesn't output anything. Um, and we just resort to some default, some heuristic. So this whole thing is one unit. We have many units. Um, and the difference between each unit is how long the history is. So we start off just looking at the last four targets, and then we exponentially increase that going up, um, potentially into the thousands. Um, so in this case, it's the last 256 targets is the maximum. We simultaneously, when we encounter a branch, um, access each of these units. And if more than one of them hit, and they disagree on where the branch is going to go, we break the tie by picking the prediction that comes from the shortest history. So this is um, supposed to represent the most recent behavior of the program. Um, it helps it adapt more quickly. And that's it. Now, that was kind of technical, but I want to briefly return to the humanistic part of the paper, don't trust folklore. What does that mean? Well, before the paper was published, this optimization, jump threading, was part of the conventional wisdom of implementing fast interpreters. And even after the paper, it still persisted. Um, if, you do, if you do some generic search like uh, interpreter optimization techniques, you still get tutorials and blog posts and sometimes academic slides that say, do this. Um, what can we do about that? Well, I think the wrong lesson to learn here is that you know, premature optimization is the root of all evil. I don't think this is a case of premature optimization for a couple reasons. Um, first of all, it's not reasonable to expect a compiler to ever figure this out. It, it's, there's too many semantics going on here. Um, also, if you're working on the Python interpreter and you have a chance to make every Python program run twice as fast, you take that chance, don't you? I mean, it's pretty obvious. Um, and jump threading really did work. It solved a real problem. So the problem isn't that jump threading was wrong. It's more like it didn't continue to be right in perpetuity as the hardware evolved underneath it. And that, I think, is what folklore means here for our purposes. It's knowledge that outlives the circumstances in which it is useful. Um, and in software development in general, I think that's something we are ill-equipped to recognize and correct. That's all I got, um, some important recognitions. Julian Squires wrote a blog post, uh, Are Jump Tables Always Fastest? that kicked off my uh, interest in the subject in the first place. He does talks for Papers We Love Montreal. Um, the other links here are uh, accessible introductions to 
branch prediction. Um, so if you're interested in this kind of thing, that's a good place to look. Uh, Agner Fog in particular is some kind of superhero. Um, anyway, questions? Thank you. We've got time for two questions, I think. Up front here. I know I said I would stop for questions in the middle. I forgot, so sorry. So why do you think the newer processors got so much better at that? Is that because they implement this I tag? Uh, yeah, um, I think it just has to do with a smaller process. You can squeeze in more memory. Um, you, I'm, I'm speculating here. I don't know anything about anything. But the if you compare these indirect branches to the direct branches, you can store like a long string of ones and zeros pretty cheaply. And that's like, you know, your full global target history of uh, basic if else statements. But indirect branches, the way they're implemented in machine code, it's not even like you're picking one out of eight. It's you're picking one out of two to the 48. It's an arbitrary address. So how you store that gets much more complicated. Um, and I'm sorry I can't go into more detail because I don't know, but I, I suspect that's it. Anyone else? All right, if not, we'll move on to the last talk of the night. So um, I'm going to be talking about a paper um, by Hao, Hao Huang. Um, I forget the actual title, but he solves the sensitivity conjecture. Um, I'm Ho Min Lee. I'm a data scientist at Datadog. And before I did this thing called data science, I was in academia for way too long studying Boolean function analysis, where um, it's proving theorems about Boolean functions and mostly about how to represent them, their complexity, and we like to pretend that it's useful, but um, it's not. Uh, and <laughs> as Alon, I think, it, when in the introduction said something about how it relates to work at Data Science at Datadog, that's not true. Uh, this, is, this is like a completely theoretical paper. Um, we do like, one thing I'll say about Boolean function analysis is that it's much harder than anything that's on the reals. And so um, when you talk about something like deep neural nets and like talk about how wide they are and how um, deep they are, that's like a complexity measure. And we understand that a lot better than we understand Boolean functions. Um, so Boolean functions are hard, but useless. Um, all right, so um, there was this conjecture that was open for 25 years. Um, and it's really easy to state. And I'm going to spend most of this talk st kind of stating it. and. Um, it's been kind of embarrassing that we haven't been able to prove it. I may or may not have spent a lot of time thinking about it. Um, but yeah, how Hong proved it. Um, and it was all over the blogosphere of my small community. Um, there's one blog in my small community that other people outside the community read, and so he posted about it also. There was a um, very nice article, um, popular article about it in Quanta. And that made it to the first page of Hacker News, which meant that like there's a humongous spotlight shown upon our small community, and we all got very excited. Um, everybody noted that the paper was extremely short, so that's the entirety of it. Um, the proof starts in the middle of page three and ends at the end of page four, so it really is just a page and a half. And I think the proof is gonna take like two slides of my slides, so. All right, um, so let me just motivate the problem. Um, let me talk about Boolean functions. So these are functions that take n bits to one bit. And I'm going to be coloring the, if it outputs 0, it's going to be orange. And if it outputs 1, it'll be purple. And just to give you an example, um, here is the and function. So and fi function takes an n bits. I'm only using 3 here because I'm lazy. And um, it only outputs 1 if all the inputs are 1. Um, what I'm showing here is called the truth table representation. So you have every possible 2 to the n inputs, all the possible 2 to the n outputs, and that specifies the function. 
and it is like, you know, uh, takes two to the n um, complexity to show you what's going on. Here's a different representation. This is the Boolean hypercube. So once again, you have uh, two to the n nodes. Each <coughs> one's an input. They're connected if they differ in one bit. Um, I'm ordering them from the number of least number of ones to most number of ones, and the all ones is purple because that outputs one, and it, the rest are zeros. Similarly, we have or, so it's always one except if it's all zeros. That's what the hypercube looks like. Uh, majority is a good one. Um, so if greater than n over two of the inputs are one, it outputs one. And it has a nice hypercube picture. Parity, um, so here if the number of inputs has an odd number, oh, sorry, if the input has an odd number of ones, then it outputs one. If it's even, it outputs zero. So this has a really nice one because every level is going to have a different color now. It's going to alternate. So um, all the functions I defined before were on n bits, but I was just showing you on three bits because I'm lazy. Um, here is a function called e12, which is only defined on three bits. And so it outputs one if um, the input is, has one or two ones, and then outputs zero if it has zero or three ones. That looks like that. <coughs> All right, so um, both the truth table and the hypercube, uh, you know, the, you have to put everything down basically. So we have um, we want to come up with like more compressed forms of representing these functions. Um, so a big one is what we call multilinear polynomials. So here uh, we take functions over the reals, um, and we want these functions. So like you could put like any real number in, it'll output a real number. Um, but we want that so that on inputs that are happen to be a zero one to the n, it has to output a zero one. Right? And we call the degree of the function to be the length of the largest monomial. Um, and there's a theorem out there that sh uh, says that if your Boolean function depends on all n of the inputs, that the degree has to be at least log n. So example. Um, the AND has a really su super simple one. It's just you're going to multiply all the variables together. Right? And it's easy to see why. Um, if they're all 1, it's 1. And if any of them are 0, then that mon monomial is going to turn to 0 and function output 0. The OR is a little more complicated. So here you want to output 1 whenever anything is 1. Um, but then since you're adding things up, you'll go over one and you want to actually output one, so you have to do this inclusion-exclusion kind of thing so that it all works out. Um, parity also um, also has degree n like the ones before it. It's a little more complicated and now you start seeing some coefficients. Um, and then that e12 function I showed you before, um, just the thing to note here is that because it doesn't output one for the all ones um, input. It has degree only two uh, as opposed to three or um, like the ones before it. All right, so um, all the functions I showed you before might make you think that Boolean functions are easy, but I remember I said they were hard, right? And so here's an interesting um, function kind of show you that Boolean functions are kind of are a rich, pretty rich class and you can do crazy things with them. So this is called the addressing function. Um, it's only defined for n that's equal to m plus 2 to the m. And let's, for the, this example, let's take m to be 2. So n is going to be 2 plus 2 to the 2, which is 2 plus 4, which is 6. And so it's only defined on um, inputs of six, length 6. Now the first m bits, colored green here, are addressing bits. And the, they address into the yellow bits. And so, for instance here, the green bits are one and zero, and one zero in binary is, um, is a binary representation of two. And so, you're gonna now output the second bit of the yellow string, but we count from zero, start from zero, right? So, zero, one, two, that bit happens to be zero, and that's not gonna be the thing that you output. Crazy function, right? Um, the way to represent this is basically, for your every yellow bit, you 
you, multi you get the address, and then things that are one, you put x, and if for the things that are z zero, you put one minus x, and you multiply it together. And so the, you can see that the addressing bits are m, and then the y is one, so this is degree m plus one, which is something a little less than log n. Um, and this is nice because it's like a tight example because before, remember I said that every function has to have degree at least log n, and this one has something a little less than log n, and so this is about as like low of a degree as you can get for um, a Boolean function on n variables. Um, another representation of Boolean functions are decision trees. So this is something you're probably more familiar with. Here um, you have a variable. If it's one, you go to the right. If it's zero, you go to the left. And then you just keep going until you hit a leaf that has a zero or one. Um, this is the decision tree for an and. and um, something we care about is the maximum depth. So the maximum depth for and is n. That's or. Um, this is parity. So parity, like all of these had um, max depth n, but parity is interesting because you have to basically look at every single bit to s determine whether the thing is even or odd, and then you have a full tree. This is the addressing function I showed you before. And so here you have, um, a complete tree of depth m, so those um, x's, the green stuff, and then on the leave, on the leave, or below the addressing bits, you have like all the addressed bits, and then all zero one. Um, and remember, like uh, below here, you see uh, you have the polynomial for the addressing function, and you can kind of see, like looking at the tree, how you how given a tree, it's easy to come up with a formula also, right? All you do is you go down every path, and then you turn that into a term, and then you just add it all up. And so this shows you that the max depth of the decision tree is at least the degree of the smallest possible degree of the polynomial that represents it. And then there's also a theorem that says that the max depth of the tree is uh, upper bounded by the degree cubed. So like basically these multilinear polynomials and, de and decision tree representations are kind of the same thing. And then this whole like rich body of work that shows that a whole bunch of complexity measures um, are pretty much measuring around the same thing. I'm not gonna tell you what they are, but they're just the block sensitivity, um, the randomized decision tree complexity, certificate complexity, uh, degree, uh, approximate degree, and quantum query complexity. All of these are kind of about the same thing. One thing I didn't say is the sensitivity. So the sensitivity um, is not known to be, or was not known to be related to all these measures. So the sensitivity of a point is the number of um, neighbors where the function value difference, uh, sorry, a sensitivity of a point is the number of neighbors that the function value t changes, and the sensitivity of the function is the worst point. Um, this is really easy to see with examples. So for and, um, the all one string is the most sensitive point, right? Because you can just see if you flip any of those bits, it turns orange. And so and has a sensitivity of n. Or, all same thing, um, the all zeros is the most sensitive point and the function has a sensitivity of n. Majority, it's like around n over two, right? Like the things in the middle, half of them will take you from purple to orange or vice versa. And then for parity, since every layer has a different color, it's fully sensitive. Any point, if you flip any bit, it'll go from even to odd or odd to even. All right, um, I'm gonna show you a more interesting function. So this is called the tribes function. So here, you're gonna split your n input bits into square root of n, um, square root n, n, what they call tribes, of square root of n variables each. And so the function is one if one tribe is fully one. So the degree of this function is n, right? Because um, remember, we saw before that the ands look like, have polynomials that look like that, the ors have polynomials that look like that, and they both have full degree. So you're going to have the or function, like replace the, the variables in or function with the tribes, and then that last, the la that last term at the end has square root of n tribes in it, and then for, to represent the, each tribe, you need the square root of n variables in the tribe. So square root of n times um, square root of n, you get n. And so the degree of this function is n. Um, 
For the sensitivity, on the other hand, we get square root of n. And to see this, basically, remember the most sensitive point of the or is the all zeros point, and the most sensitive point of the and is the all ones point. So imagine an input that has one tribe is all ones, and then the rest are zero. So then as soon as any individual variable in that tribe goes from one to zero, that and will go to zero, and then the or goes to zero, and so then it'll flip values. So here we have an example of something where the degree and sensitivity are like fairly far off from each other. All right, uh, last example, but it's gonna be a doozy. Um, remember that E12 function? Imagine um, having three to the k uh, of these all feeding into each other. So like you have three variables that go into an E12, you have three E12s going to another E12, and more of those just building all that up. So that's the E12k function. So the degree is two to the k. So remember before I sh we saw that that's the polynomial for it and it all had only degree two. But the top one's gonna have degree two of the things below it and then it's gonna have degree two of the th below that. So if you multiply all that up, you get two to the k. The sensitivity on the other hand um, is going to be 3 to the k. And to see that, um, remember this, a single e12 looks like this. And now imagine the all zeros input. So if you have all zeros input, now you flip one of those inputs to one. So the e12 that it feeds into are, is going to go from zero to one. And the e12 that that feeds into will go from zero to one. And that'll just percolate all the way up until like the final e12 on top turns goes from zero to one. So basically, it's the all zeros string is sensitive on every input for this function. And so the tribes was degree was n, sensitivity root n. Um, that e, e12k function, sensitivity was 2 to the k, which is the same thing as n to the 1 over log 3, which is like n to the 0.6. And the sensitivity was n. So you know, like you have this interplay. Um, you can show that the sensitivity is at least, or at most, the degree squared, always. And so the conjecture, this is like, was the big conjecture is, can you upper bound the degree by the sensitivity? Right, because like, remember with the decision trees, like we had this nice thing where we knew that no matter which direction you went, the degree and the uh, decision tree depth was always about the same. Can you do the same thing for sensitivity? So the best bound we had up until this paper was that you can upper bound the degree by two to the three sensitivity times the sensitivity cubed, which was pretty terrible. Um, the proof was really hard and complicated, and yeah, a lot of people spent a lot of time trying to improve this. But he showed that the degree is at most sensitivity squared. And so then you have this nice relationship that the degree is less than or equal to sensitivity squared, which is less than the, the degree to the fourth. Um, so how did he show this? So an equivalent conjecture between the sensitivity degree one is the following. Say you have the hypercube. You color half the nodes purple, half the nodes plus one purple. And what's, um, does there always exist a purple node that has square root of n purple neighbors? So if you look at the parity function, you know that if you color exactly half purple, then you can have zero purple, all the purple nodes can have zero purple neighbors. But if you add just one more, are you always gonna have a node that has square root of n purple neighbors? That's, that's an equivalent conjecture. And so the theorem he proves is that that is the case. And so here, H is his notation for that set of um, half, you colored half the, nodes, half the nodes plus one purple. And then that delta of H is the node with the most purple neighbors. And so he's saying that that has, um, it's, that has degree greater than X, square root of N. So how does he show that? So, um, he creates a gigantic adjacency matrix. So it's two to the n by two to the n. Um, it's gonna have zeros where there's no edge in the Boolean hypercube. And ones or minus one where there is an edge. 
And this is like where the magic happens. Um, he like puts the minus ones in just a way so that the eigens values of this matrix are, half of them are square root of n and the other half are minus square root of n. So then um, A sub H is gonna be the induced subgraph. So like, eight, remember H is those half, you took half the vertices plus one and you color them purple. So that's the adjacency matrix uh, reduced to just those vertices. And the max degree of that is gonna be at least the top eigenvalue. And to see that, um, basically if you have an adjacency matrix, the top eigenvalue is gonna be like the L1 norm of the row. Um, and he shows that this is true, not just for adjacency matrix, but also these funny adjacency matrices where, matrices where some of the entries are minus one. And then he pulls out this thing called the Cauchy interlace theorem that says that the eigenvalues of any submatrix of a matrix are related to each other in this way so that you can lower bound that top eigenvalue of the induced subgraph by the eigenvalue of the, the original one, which is um, exactly root n. So that's it. Um, that's that whole proof in a tweet. <laughs> <laughs> And if you have any questions. Thank you. Are there any questions? We'll get it from back there. So you mentioned that this is not at all related to what you work on now. <laughs> but obviously, people care a lot about this, and it was a big deal that this was solved. What, what does this open up besides a better lower bound? Um, it doesn't open up a lot of things in the sense that it's something that everybody assumed to be true, right? Like nobody thought that the true upper bound was that exponential crazy thing. <laughs> um, I think it's more in the, te the techniques that he, he introduced in solving it so simply probably will be able my guess is that there'll be a dozen papers out next year that use that in use different settings and solve more or less important open problems. Um. Any other questions? Nope, we got one. <laughs> so I read the popular article about this and the big takeaway was like, Oh my God, you dumb computer scientists, you should have studied math. So like, <laughs> what math were the computer scientists um, who were studying this missing that um, might have come, made them come to this conclusion earlier? I, I of course, take offense to that. <laughs> <laughs> you were the one who were, had the, um, the code of conduct violation earlier, right? <laughs> 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 so yeah, I would, I would, so I mean, it was all linear algebra, and I, I think it's linear algebra that computer scientists use all the time anyway. Um, I think it just more comes down to like, combinatorics is really hard, and it doesn't have like a, unlike other fields of math, it doesn't have like a good unified way of approaching problems, and that's why like, things like this can happen much more easily, I think, in combinatorics than other fields. All right, I think on that note, uh, we'll call it a night. Thank you. Thank you to all our speakers, our presenters. <laughs>